Hi, everyone, and welcome to uh, my presentation, Executive Functioning in Adolescence with XXY, Results from the BGAP Study. Um, I'm Vanessa Auschuler, and this project was done in collaboration with Stanford School of Medicine and Nemours Children Health System. The research being conducted at Stanford is being led by Dr. Alan Reese, and the research being conducted at Nemours is being led by Dr. Judith Ross and all of these other wonderful people have contributed to this project as well. So as is evident by the title, today we'll be discussing um, Kleinfelter syndrome and executive functioning. So as I'm sure many of you know, Kleinfelter syndrome or KS is caused by an extra X chromosome in males. So they're born with two X chromosomes and one Y chromosome. Previous research has found alterations in executive function or EF within adults with Kleinfelter syndrome. However, very few studies have examined alterations within EF um, within adolescents with KS. And for sort of your own like knowledge and reference point, um, EF is a set of higher order cognitive um, domains or skills that are really important for several aspects of our life. So these skills include things like self-control, working memory, and cognitive flexibility. And they really are skills that help us to organize and manage the tasks of our life. So essentially in this analysis and for this presentation, we wanted to assess the differences in EF between adolescents with KS and typically developing or TD boys without KS. And to do that, we looked at really in-depth measures of executive function through the DCEFs and BRIEF2. Um, people that were included in this participant, or sorry, in this project um, includes baseline participants from the brain genes and puberty study. And as I mentioned previously, um, all participants were seen at either Stanford University or at Moore's Thomas Jefferson University. Um, it's important to note that due to the pandemic, a portion of the participants completed their assessments uh, remotely via Zoom. And also all of the KS participants are considered to have non-mosaic Kleinfelter syndrome. And this is confirmed through karyotype diagnoses. So a brief overlook at participants included in this analysis. So they are all males. We have 33 boys with KS and 41 um, TD boys included in this analysis. As you can see, both groups are well matched in terms of age, as well as their stage of pubertal development as measured by um, Tanner stage. We can also look at the IQ of the two groups. So two subdivisions of IQ is the um, the verbal IQ and visual spatial IQ. And as we can see, both groups are well matched on their visual spatial IQ, um, but they do differ significantly on their verbal IQ. And in our sample, the Kleinfelter syndrome boys had a significantly lower verbal IQs than the typically developing boys. But this is of no surprise as this is well documented in um, previous research that's been conducted within these populations. I will also note that of these 33 um, KS boys included in the sample, only four had already initiated their pubertal testosterone replacement therapy. So most of these boys have yet to begin testosterone um, around puberty time. So to begin, we can look at the DCEFs. DCEFs is a cognitive assessment that is administered to our participants. And so to analyze this data, we took age adjusted or scaled scores for several of the DCEF subtests, and we compared the scores between the two groups. So comparing scores from the KS group to the TD group. We also controlled for the fact that some of the um, administrations were done remotely over Zoom um, due to the global pandemic. So we explored the following DCAF subtest, and we'll go through each one separately now. So to begin, we can talk about trail making as the first subtest. Um, this subtest measures visual scanning, visual motor processing skills, sequencing skills, and flexibility of thinking. This subtest has five conditions. The first condition is um, visual scanning, where the participants are asked to mark a line across all of a certain number that's repeated on the pages. The next condition is number sequencing, where they're asked to um, draw a line to connect all the numbers in order. Then there is letter sequencing, which is the same as number sequencing, but connecting the letters in order. 
Then there's number letter switching, where now they're asked to connect a number to a letter, to a number, to a letter in order. And finally, motor speed, where they're asked to draw over a dotted line as quickly as possible, making sure to touch every circle along the path. So this is what we found. And before we dive into the specifics, I just want to orient you to a few things. This is what the graphs will look like for all of DCAFs. And as you can see, we are um, graphing the scaled scores for each group. So this is the average for the Kleinfelter group will be in this like salmony color. And the averages for the TD group will be in this like turquoisey color. The bars represent standard deviations. And anytime there's a significant difference in performance between the two groups, it'll be marked by this little asterisk. For the DCAPs, lower scaled scores indicate a worse performance on the assessment or more issues with that sort of those skills, those executive functioning skills that are used for that um, assessment. So specifically for trail making, we can see that in the letter sequencing condition, um, boys with Kleinfelter syndrome took longer to complete the task when compared to the typically developing boys. And there are no significant differences in any of the other conditions for this subtest. Next, we can look at verbal fluency. So this measures the child's ability to quickly retrieve information from memory. The first condition is letter fluency, where they're asked to list as many words as they can think of that begin with a specific letter. The next condition is category fluency, where they're asked to list as many words as they can think of that begin or that fall within a certain category. And finally, category switching, where now they need to provide words switching back and forth between two categories. So what we found for verbal fluency is that on the letter fluency condition, um, boys with Kleinfelter syndrome on average got less total correct items within the allotted time when compared to the TD boys. And there are no significant differences in the other conditions or metrics. The next subtest is design fluency. So this measures planning, cognitive flexibility, and fluency in generating visual patterns quickly. Um, for this task, the participants are asked to draw as many different designs as they can think of within a certain amount of time. So first is filled dots. So they're asked to only touch filled dots. And then empty dots, where they touch only empty dots. And finally, switching, where they're asked to draw designs switching between touching empty and filled dots. So for this subtest, we found that um, both the filled dots and switching conditions showed significant differences. So in both conditions, boys with Kleinfelter syndrome got less um, correct designs within the allotted time when compared to TD boys. You can see that here as well. And there are no significant difference um, found in the empty dots condition. And for the composite, it's looking across all three conditions. And very similarly, um, there is a significant difference where boys with Kleinfelter syndrome in general across all three conditions have less correct designs within the allotted time when compared to TD boys. The next subtest is color word interference. This measures visual auditory processing skills, ability to inhibit um, automatic responses, and flexibility of thinking. The first condition um, is color naming, where they're asked to say the color of the boxes provided. Next is word reading, where they're asked to read the word. Then is inhibition, where they're asked to say the color of the ink the words are printed in and not read the word. And finally is inhibition switching, where they're asked to say the color of the ink or read the word if it's in a box. So this is the most complex um, of the conditions. So what we found is that both the word reading and inhibition conditions showed significant differences. In both conditions, boys with Kleinfelter syndrome took longer to complete the task when compared to TD boys. There are no significant differences in the other two conditions. The next subtest is sorting. So this measures concept formation skills, pattern recognition, problem solving, and the ability to explain abstract sorting principles. In this subtest, the participants are provided with um, six cards. They have different um, shapes, colors, designs, or words on them. And the participants are asked to create two groups with three cards in each group. In the first condition, pre-sorting, they are essentially evaluated based on two things. 
One is the sorts themselves that they made, the two groups. And the second thing they're measured on is how well they're able to describe how they sorted the two groups. In the second condition, sort recognition, the examinee sorts the cards for them and the participant simply needs to explain how they were sorted. So they're only measured on their description of the sorts. What we found for this subtest is that there are actually no significant differences in performance between the Kleinfelter boys and the TD boys. So they did about the same on all uh, conditions and metrics. The next subtest is 20 questions. So this measures ability to categorize and formulate abstract questions. This is very similar to the childhood game you likely played where the participants get 20 yes or no questions to try to identify an item that's been selected from the stimulus page. And so what we found here um, are three significant differences. So um, the first metric is total weighted achievement. You can think of this metric as measuring um, how optimal the questions are. So from all the questions asked really, yeah, how optimally are they um, trying to identify the item? And so we can see that boys with KS um, were asking less optimal questions when compared to TD boys. The next metric is initial abstraction score. This measures how strategic the very first question asked is and is thought to be a measure of abstract thinking. And so we can also see that the boys with KS on average um, had lower initial abstraction scores when compared to TD boys. And then finally, we can see a significant difference in the total number of questions asked where boys with KS on average were asking more questions to identify the item when compared to TD boys. The last subtest for DCAPS is word context. So this measures deductive reasoning, ability to integrate information, hypothesis testing, and flexibility of thinking. For this subtest, participants are provided with words from a made up language and they get five clue sentences for each word to try to guess what the word means. And what we found is that the two groups differed significantly in the primary measure, which is total consecutively correct. So this tells us that boys with Kleinfelter syndrome on average got less items consecutively correct, um, essentially for each word provided when compared to TD boys. So what does this all mean? That was a lot for DCAPS. Um, essentially a summary is that we found significant differences on all subtests, um, but one. So there are no differences in sorting, um, but there are differences in the other subtests explored. And we found that on, in general across these subtests, boys with Kleinfelter syndrome are not performing as well on these assessments when compared to TD boys. So they're showing some impairments of executive function. The other metric we looked at is the brief two. This is a parent report where parents are asked to report on the executive function of the child. So they're provided sentences and asked to indicate if it's never, sometimes, or often true of their child. And so to analyze this data, we took the age-adjusted T-scores and we compared, again, between the two groups, so KS versus TD. We looked at these index indexes. So um, first, there's a behavioral regulation index. This measures the ability to regulate and monitor behavior effectively. Then we looked at the emotion regulation index, which measures the ability to regulate feelings and respond to changing situations. Next, we looked at the cognitive regulation index which uh, measures the ability to solve problems and control or manage cognitive processes. And finally, we looked at the global executive composite, which really looks across all three of these domains, which make up executive functioning, to get a very global look at the functioning and the skills available. So what we found is that on all three index scores, uh, boys with Kleinfelter syndrome showed more impairments in executive function. So higher T-scores in this case indicate um, more issues with um, EF. So as we can see on all three of these, on the index scores, boys with Kleinfelter syndrome are showing more issues. And in the composite, it's the same case. So across all three domains, looking um, large scale at executive function abilities, boys with Kleinfelter syndrome are having more issues when compared to the TD boys in the sample. 
So what does this all mean? Um, essentially, this cross-sectional analysis did find altered executive function in adolescent boys with KS when compared to age-matched TD boys. Specifically, adolescents with KS had reduced performance on all but one subtest of the DCAS, which we explored. And based on the specific subtests and conditions that showed impairments, we can say that KS boys showed impaired verbal fluency, sequencing, planning, inhibition, abstract thinking, deductive reasoning, and flexible thinking abilities. Additionally, they showed impairments across all domains and sort of the global composite um, of EF by parent report in the brief too. So that's a lot of really great findings. However, there's still a lot that we um, don't know. So we still don't know how these alterations might change longitudinally through puberty. Um, we are also left wondering what roles gonadal hormones like LH, um, luteinizing hormone, FSH or follicle stimulating hormone and testosterone might play in these alterations that we're seeing around puberty time in adolescent boys with KS. And a major question for our study is um, if or how testosterone replacement therapy in KS might influence these alterations. And so the way that we can go about answering these questions is on our side, we can continue to um, see new participants to collect baseline data, and we can continue to see uh, participants longitudinally and continue to analyze the data. But on your end, you could help us by joining the study and um, helping us to find out more. So we are still recruiting um, new baseline participants to join our study. So right now we're recruiting boys ages eight through 17, both with and without MKS. And brothers of boys with KS are also welcome to join the study. You do need to be English speaking. And right now due to um, travel restrictions um, with the pandemic, you do also for the time being need to live in the United States to join our study. But participation involves two to three annual visits where you'll do a physical exam, a blood draw, um, a cognitive assessment, well, many cognitive assessments and an MRI scan. But a lot of our data now is actually collected remotely via video visits. Um, and it's just a very abbreviated in-person visit that we do to wrap up some of the assessments like the blood draw, physical, MRI, and a few cognitive assessments that can't be completed um, remotely. So if you're interested, you can go to is.gd slash study to sign up, or you can visit our website or contact us uh, for more information. Uh, we want to give a giant, huge thank you to all of our participants and their family for all of their time and their continued participation. So year two testing is well underway, as well as uh, year three testing for a few participants. So none of this would be um, possible without our wonderful participants. Um, and then, of course, also thank you to our sponsors who have funded our research, so the National Institute of Health. If you have any questions, uh, like I said, feel free to contact us and I am happy to answer any questions specifically about this presentation. And um, thank you so much for your time and for attending and listening.